In the early 1970s, inspired by the success of the French New Wave, directors like Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola and Michael Cimino forged a new era in Hollywood of director-led films, using innovative techniques to tell transgressive stories while promising commercial success. This is the story of how a group of young filmmakers took the industry by storm, bringing highbrow art to American moviegoers and building massive personal brands, only for it to crash down around them. This is the rise of New Hollywood. Many of the films making up this movement are bona fide classics. Several have entered the pop cultural subconsciousness. I'm walking here! You talking to me? I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> in turn, and in contrast with their groundbreaking cinematic styles, these films also often call back to old Hollywood, cherry-picking characters, genres, and visual ideas from this classic period. As a movement, New Hollywood is predominantly focused on individualist stories, with outsider protagonists on screen and auteur directors off screen. It's perhaps unsurprising then that the reasons given for the movement's downfall include overly strong creative control and heavy drug use. But that's a story for another time. For now, cast your mind back to 1967 and to the rise of New Hollywood. As America dealt with economic downturn and younger audiences became disaffected with the cinema-going experience, mainstream films started to reflect these concerns. A few late 60s films, notably Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate, focus on outsiders pushing against social norms. In the former, a pair of young lovers become bank robbers, claiming a socially-minded motivation. You ain't gonna have a minute's peace. You promise? In the latter, a young man expresses his dissatisfaction with his middle-class suburban life by having an affair. Both films take boundary-pushing characters, themes and aesthetics and make them palatable to general audiences by placing the stories in the context of a comfortable suburban setting or a familiar genre. After all, despite being a new approach, this is still Hollywood and appealing to mainstream audiences was part of the movement's success. Midnight Cowboy is arguably the first new Hollywood film to feature characters living very clearly on the margins of society. Following a male prostitute living rough in New York, it was the first X-rated film nominated for an Oscar. Two months after its release, a popular phenomenon erupted with the first screenings of Easy Rider. Wyatt and Billy, newly rich from a drug deal in Mexico, journey across the heart of America to celebrate Mardi Gras in New Orleans. This film's loose, handheld camera work, lens flares and zoom shots were bold stylistic choices in the late 60s, taking cues from cinema verite and documentary filmmaking while also foregrounding the artificiality of the form, being more impressionistic than traditional. But more than that, the film is very pointedly an introduction to counterculture for mainstream America. With its dropout protagonists, jukebox soundtrack, non-linear editing and freeform narrative, Easy Rider advocates for counterculture openly and unabashedly, and its success signalled a shift in American cinema goers' tastes that the major film studios quickly picked up on. The crime elements of Easy Rider are a recurring feature across New Hollywood. Characters like taxi driver's Travis Bickle make a living on the edge. Others offer alternative structures to live in, like organised crime. This is in part a systematic criticism of America's societal issues at the time, where film audiences were experiencing rampant inflation and institutional distrust. Sound familiar? In Dog Day Afternoon, these tensions come to the fore. Based on a real-life crime, the film follows a botched armed robbery committed by Sonny and the ensuing media circus. Nobody move. Get over there. Directed by Sidney Lumet, the pared-back visual approach stands out as particularly utilitarian in a movement known for its naturalistic, documentarian style. Lumet's commitment to realism is admirable, 
the opening set piece takes place in near real time, lending a breathless tension that's punctuated by dark comedy. As in Bonnie and Clyde, the crime elements of the story mask a deeper societal dissatisfaction. The most iconic moment from the film Attica! 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 refers to a then recent prison riot where police were condemned for their brutality. And Sonny's crime isn't the only thing that makes him an outsider. His trans lover, albeit played by a cisgender man, is a prominent character, a rarity even in today's cinema. Another element of the tensions simmering under the surface of Dog Day Afternoon, and present across the movement in general, is the Vietnam War, which entered its final years just as New Hollywood got underway. We're Vietnam veterans, so killing don't mean anything to us, you understand? The most iconic Vietnam War film, Apocalypse Now, was directed by New Hollywood stalwart Francis Ford Coppola in 1979, and multiple Vietnam veterans feature to varying degrees across these films. War also rears its head elsewhere, but the most lasting portrait of the impact of the war at home is The Deer Hunter. The film opens with a bittersweet wedding ceremony in a close-knit Slavic American community. Soon after, the groom and two of his friends, Michael and Nick, leave for Vietnam. While there, a traumatic experience as prisoners of war changes them forever. Famous for its notoriously difficult production, The Deer Hunter is a lavish and impactful treatment of a then taboo topic in America. Led by a trio of sensitive performances from Robert De Niro, Christopher Walken and Meryl Streep, it's a gorgeously shot film telling a complex, multifaceted story over a significant runtime. Director Michael Cimino quickly earned a reputation as an exacting, mercurial filmmaker, and was caught out in a few mistruths during press for the film, including the likely false claim that Russian Roulette was played with American POWs. The studio braced to make a loss on the film worried about the long runtime, including the opening wedding sequence almost a third of the film's duration. In the end, The Deer Hunter was a massive critical and financial success. Whether the film tapped into popular feeling on the war, or whether the craft of the movie won audiences over, Chimino became the poster child of a film movement that placed risky auteurship at its heart. God bless America, my And just two years later, another costly gamble by Chimino flopped at the box office, bringing the movement crashing down. More on that in part two, The Fall of New Hollywood.